I think I was I was surprised actually by the Fontaine quest. And I mm-hmm. I really I think Farina especially is such a breath of fresh air. Yes. Um and Sumeru, I think the quests were good, but I think the stakes were different. Hey everyone, it's Sevi and welcome back to Sevi Talks, where we cover a range of topics from Genshin to guides. That's not right. It's not guides. From Genshin to games to guests and <laughs> stories. <laughs> guides in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, the guides are haunting me. Our special guest is none other than Dish. Hello, Dish. How are you doing today? I'm doing good today. It's like 8 a.m., but I'm like wide awake for this. In this podcast, we're going to talk a little a bit about Dish and also a little bit about Fontaine. And this is our first episode off of our short hiatus of Sevi Talks, which I had to take because like Fontaine brought in a lot of new content to like, mm-hmm. you know, make True. videos on and keep streaming on. And we're gonna so we're gonna talk a lot about that. But before we get to the Fontaine stuff. Um, I do want to like ask about the dish stuff. By the way, I almost forgot to say and do this, but we're going to be discussing a lot of Fontaine, Archon Quest, and story content. So here is your spoiler warning for the rest of your episode. If you haven't done the Archon Quest yet, you may want to wait until you finish that one before diving into the rest of this episode. Dish, it's been like three plus years of Genshin stuff like Genshin content yeah I particularly remember you coming out especially um at the start of the Genshin scene because Mm. you were particularly like one of the women streamers and then Mm. content creators like YouTubers overall who like started getting there you know it was like consistent and it was like a lot of content so how Mm. is it starting that out Oh man, that was such an interesting time because I hadn't been streaming that long just in general. I had ugh, maybe maybe a year under my belt when things started to get like really serious with Genshin. I wasn't expecting it to be, I don't know, it it happened so quickly just like how Genshin grew very quickly. It was so it was like a global sensation. <laughs> and I just happened to be in the right place at the right time, honestly, like that's where I got the initial boost. Um, and when I started to just get really excited about content and growth and numbers, but I would say the same thing about just content as a whole, like I got lucky, I hit the right market unintentionally Mm -hmm. at the right time. And I got a huge boost from just like basically riding the wave of Genshin. I've like always been, um, I don't want to say results driven. That sounds so like type A of me. Um, but I really <laughs> enjoy like seeing the fruits of my labor and and seeing like good feedback. I, it was yeah. just like impossible to stop. I I had was having so much fun having mm-hmm. videos do well and responding to comments and establishing myself in the content world. Um, and it wasn't until probably like probably till Inazuma came out that I was like, yeah. oh my gosh, this is like my job. Like I, this is what I do now. Like I, mm-hmm. how did I, how did I get here? <laughs> Results driven. Like I totally understand that whether that's like type A or whatever, because like having that amount of feedback, like getting that feedback loop and it just keeps mm-hmm. building and building. It's kind of addicting. And like so much so that even when you don't get as much feedback or even when you get negative feedback, like mm-hmm. once you're in it, it's kind of hard to stop. Yeah. Even when I get tired of of working sometimes, I think, oh, I, I can't I don't know how much longer I could do this. Um, <laughs> but I, I take like two days off and I'm, and I'm I can't resist it. Like I I love it. <laughs> and even if it changes shape over the years, which it has, I don't yeah. think I'll be able to completely step away from from content. At least not as far as I can tell. <laughs> I totally understand that. Like there are days when I'm just like, okay, I'm kind of burnt out. And then like, I look into the future and I'm like, is it going to be like this every day or every week? Mm. And then you get over that little hump or you've like so slowly like shovel yourself out again. And then like, you keep going. What were you streaming and making content of before Genshin came around? Oh gosh. Uh, My first step into content was not gaming at all. It mm-hmm. was on TikTok. Um, I started doing, started like slightly before the pandemic, um, but I did basically like introspective journal type content. So 
I would write something, it'd be be short. Um, and I would record a video that kind of, kind of like went with it. I, I don't even know. I called them inner monologues. Um, and the aim was just to like express what I was experiencing, especially during that time in the pandemic where we're all like, yeah. More than most of us in our, at least in our lifetimes, have experienced like facing threats of mortality and oh, you know, yeah. acquainting ourselves. Hey, you know, we're just in a weird, yeah, like the kind intense of, stuff. It's intense, yeah, very intense. Yeah. And um, it was very cool connecting with people that way in a very vulnerable space. So that turned into gaming when I bought a Switch, a Nintendo Ooh. Switch, and I bought. Animal Crossing New Horizons. And I had already been live streaming on TikTok, just like cooking and talking or whatever, no, nothing, no gaming. And then I did a TikTok live. It was like a budget, it was like a discount, like Twitch stream. I had my camera like f- like sitting on the, or my phone, yeah. sitting on the table and a mirror, like a, like a hand mirror right here facing me. So if you were watching the TikTok live, you could see a mirror, which pointed to me, and then you could see the TV. <laughs> and that was my <laughs> first gaming stream. So I did it like twice. And I was like, you know, my husband, Joshua, happens to, he streamed before I did. And oh. he happened to have a streaming setup. So I was like, um, can I use it? And he <laughs> very quickly obliged. And uh, I did mostly Animal Crossing I did like Minecraft, mostly community oriented stuff. Um, And then from there, I started branching into story driven games. I was just going to say games that like really set me up to enjoy Genshin. Yeah. um, Were like, I played Portal. I played um, like a lot of platformers, um, just like short story, like experience games kind of. Genshin came out. My viewership actually sink- tanked a little bit when I would play Genshin because it's mm-hmm. not what people were used to. Mm-hmm. Oh, Undertale was another one that I played. Oh, yeah. I was um, thinking that genre. Like, mm-hmm. it sounds like, okay. Yeah. Uh, just, like, experiencing stories with my viewers. So, obviously, Genshin is a bit different. It was mm-hmm. my first ever, like, open world RPG. And I just got sucked in. And it didn't have an immediate benefit on my viewership until mm-hmm. it probably took a month before of like posting on TikTok, gaming content on TikTok before I started to see my viewership go up. I did like dual stream. I would stream yeah. on t- TikTok and I'd be like, come over to Twitch. And that's how I got my initial like 20, 20, 30 viewers. Um, and it stayed kind of in that range for a couple months, slowly moved up to like 60 range. And then it like... <laughs> and then, it, whoosh, yeah. <laughs> the- did that come with um, the YouTube? Like, was it YouTube that pushed it? Yes, it was definitely YouTube. Um, I think TikTok has its value in getting like face recognition, um, getting people used to seeing you and hearing you, Mm -hmm. but it's a mobile platform. So it doesn't, I never felt like it, I mean, I'd have videos go like, I'd have them get like 2 million, 3 million, 5 million views. And it marginally affected my viewership on Twitch. But when I started posting YouTube videos and those did well, that plus Genshin. Yeah. What's the point? Like a boiling point. Yeah. 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 And like the conversion of YouTube to Twitch, it's like a lot, you know, it's like a lot more solid. Well, yeah, because it's like, I mean, you can people do watch YouTube on their phones, but it's mm-hmm. also it's a it's a longer form mm. uh, media. So it's true. Pe- watching someone for 20 seconds doesn't necessarily mean that you would want to watch them live. But if you can watch someone for 10 minutes, you know, why not Mm -hmm. 30 minutes? Why not an hour? Why not have them on in the background while you're working? I think that's usually the pipeline. (laughs) We've already like got a few lessons. First of all, you can do a mirror stream on TikTok. Yeah. You don't know what else to do. (laughs) Thankfully, there's better TikTok streaming options now. But back then it was just bootleg. Yeah. I did what I had to do. I like how you said back then, and it's just like three years ago, but it feels like time is weird. Time is weird. It feels like a very short time and a yeah. very long time yeah, at the same it time. Does. Okay, so you did like the introspective, like the inner monologues. And then when you started moving to Genshin Open World, like, yeah, that was a, a pretty different genre. Mm-hmm. So did that kind of affect how you, 
I guess, process the game. Because, for example, it made a lot of sense to me when you said that you were going for story-driven games pre-Genshin. Because I feel like the way that you kind of absorb or analyze, like, Genshin's content is very story-driven. Mm. And, like, not everyone totally goes that route. There's a big variety within the Genshin space, within the gotcha space. Like, some people couldn't give a... a one crap about lore <laughs> and no no shame to them like gotcha content just like the gameplay is good enough to to make content out of just just gotcha is good yeah. enough to make content out of yeah like um, just the wishing <laughs> <laughs> just just wishing i mean it's it's good and it it makes me happy and it makes me a little sad that like my top three videos of all time they're all wishing me <laughs> and the next was like a challenge video but yeah you won't get any like story stuff until way 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 down <laughs> um i think i have a very strong emotional attachment to genshin so uh probably not until the very tail end of sumeru like the last two patches two three patches of sumeru i didn't feel any form of burnout um there were times i didn't know what to make content out of but I know I never questioned that I would stay with the game because mm -hmm. I care. There's some storylines that just like they I care so much about them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I have a strong lore brain like I'm very forgetful. I think I take a more literary approach and more communication approach to like the story of the game, like what yeah. character interactions like reveal about that character and what like what lessons is Genshin trying to like deliver through their games? That's that's where that's my bread and butter. Um, mm. I think as far as story content goes or story appreciation goes. Yeah. And I think that's kept my heart in the game. Genshin has done a pretty good job of, you know, attaching you to characters like for different aspects, whether mm -hmm. it's like the design or the combat and then most especially the story. Which yeah. storylines or which characters did you were you thinking of when you said you were so attached to her? You just needed to like see uh, them through. Obviously, the traveler's story. I that's not a surprising answer. I'm sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> the big story of the game, um, the the storyline that uh, I would say I care about the most is Kaya and Diluc. Um, I knew it. I think okay. yeah, <laughs> the writers just went crazy with that mm. and have poured so much love into it, and it, we keep going back to it. Yeah, I think I think that story just gripped my heart from the webtoon and from the first introduction to them in like the early Archon Quest. It might it's it might be a mixture of like the game was brand new and I cared about everything, but I don't yeah. know. I also have like a younger sister, so um I think siblings oh. uh, sibling angst kind of yeah. <laughs> always resonates with me. The dynamic like the thought of being estranged and and the weight that Kaya has carried over his like his destiny and and his blood relation and his what he actually believes in his desire for freedom i think he's just such a complex character i might be biased but i think he's going to end up being important to the story in the long term uh i feel like they wouldn't keep giving us little like sprinkles here and there of like kind conria um mm -hmm. abyss family yeah if he like wasn't descendant and yeah i i wouldn't i would be very happy to see that happen but i would more just want to see kaya duluk fully <laughs> reconciled, <laughs> like, reconciled. <laughs> uh, like the oh my gosh the um what was that one event the the duluk hidden strife yeah do you yeah, remember yeah. hidden strife do you remember those the letters? don winery yeah and the letters and alice's letter dude i i that was in my opinion, that's one of the most beautiful things that has ever that has ever been written for Genshin Impact. Um, yeah, yeah, I still go back and listen to it sometimes. Aww. And the letters that were in the like on top of the Knights they of Avonius, like the, yeah. the hidden ones, like oh my gosh, I can't believe that they didn't like tell us to go there. You just had to like stumble across it, but whatever. I was like talking with my chat yesterday that. Everyone, or at least a lot of characters, at least uh, of the playable characters, they would make good protagonists of their own stories. True. Of, like whether it's their own game or their own anime. Mm -hmm. But like, I think Kaya especially, like he has a lot going on there. I would watch. I would pay so much money. <laughs> yeah. 
to see that. It's like, and like <laughs> see him get through that. And even if it's like his day to day dealings of like as captain of, you know, like Favonius and then uncovering his past and stuff. Aside from mm-hmm. Kaya, could you name like one or two? characters who you would want as a protagonist main oh. protagonist main protagonist hmm my first answer was Kave. <laughs> Just I would cause. watch that I would watch yeah. that he's got he's got so much going on in his in his heart <laughs> you know <Yeah. laughs> and in his he life does. I mean his the quest that they limited quest that was for him during the freaking um I know right tri- what is it what was that it was the called? um but yeah it was the tournament dude I ended up playing that offline because I was like kind of burnt out on Genshin at the time yeah. um but I was like dang this is such a great this is so giving us so much in Kave in into Kave's character like he's such a respectable honorable person yeah it sucks um Beto also biased but I think Ooh. I would love to see her story from start to finish like they it touches on it in the hangout quest yeah with her getting like basically being orphaned and having to figure it out herself i would love to watch you know her get her vision yes oh, i feel like that's I would one love of like to the watch most, that one of the most epic vision stories in there oh, it's hard every every character i think of i'd be like yeah i'd, I'd watch that characters you know go through some character yeah. arc i feel like that's one of the things that can make you say okay this character is solid like if they can stand on their own as like a main character mm. then in a lot of ways i feel like that's a deep enough or at least a well-written enough, enough character like mm. they feel solid on their own but another thing that i wanted to like ask you about your career as a streamer is how you became known for as like a comfort streamer maybe mm. whether that was your goal or like it just happened and then taking up that being okay with that title i think my early career set the trajectory for that um a lot of my first viewers were people who found comfort in my content and in my like writing i guess um and my community really built during the super like scary parts of COVID when we really didn't even know like what the disease was or what Mm. it was capable of or how long we were going to be in this like frozen state. And I felt like my stream was kind of a, I always wanted it to be like a relief from having to think about that. Uh, Such great friendships formed from that time Um, within, I'm still literally like Last weekend, a bunch of people from my early community, they like all went and rented an Airbnb together, like 10 people um, that are still friends from that time. Um, So that I think was the starting point and it just developed over time. (sighs) I went through like a change period where I had to really evaluate what am I doing Um, Mm. was when my viewership numbers like rose really fast from in the hundred range to 700 to pushing a thousand that was great i was like happy for it because it's like well i mean could you imagine like something better happening to (laughs) someone who wants to be a streamer for (laughs) for their career like that's a good thing right yeah um but when whereas i used to look at my chat and recognize every name and know them personally suddenly i was looking at a wall of strangers who didn't necessarily know my culture or or like the culture of my stream um and i wasn't able to read every message i'm not able to read everything it's not as intimate as it used to be and there were things i used to do on my stream that i stopped doing um there was a weekly thing that i I did with my community called show and tell s and t um and it basically stemmed from me realizing there was a lot of artists and writers in my community um so we had basically like we picked a topic and people would submit written art people would submit like music paintings drawings all sorts of stuff related to the theme and then i'd look at it all on sunday and we would just like enjoy it together and it was like a very very intimate very sensitive time yeah you know people bear their souls um and i remember the last s t was when I was pushing like over a thousand viewers for the first time. <laughs> the last time I did s t 
I had to restrict my chat to people who had been following me for more than two months. Whoa. Um, because, you know, it, it got to the point where uh, people who, who people would submit stuff just to get attention. Um, people yeah. would say things just really out of pocket, insensitive things in my chat. Um, and it just I realized then it wasn't what it was mm -hmm. and it can't be what it was. Um, that was a very hard decision that I had to make. So I did that last s &T and I wrote an explanation of why I was ending it. And I don't want to like force something that was had its moment and, and yeah. is over. Trying to keep it going even when it gets like dangerous, even or maybe not so dangerous, but at least like not as constructive as like exactly. it was supposed to be. And I didn't want the memory of s &T to be soured by it like falling apart. Mm -hmm. So I ended it before that happened. Um, yeah. So all that to say, that was a tough time period when I was like losing things that felt like the most important part of my streaming habits or streaming life, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized, and also I was suddenly in the league with like, all these big streamers i'm like i i don't even see myself as like on the same level and this was before i became friends with some of them mm -hmm. um i felt weird it felt weird there weren't a lot of women like you said um yeah there weren't any women in the gaming space or sorry exactly in the genshin in the Gen space <laughs> in, the, in the genshin space um there but were yeah, a few exactly. in the genshin space it was it was just me up, up there yeah. um and i I felt insecure suddenly of like, I, you know, I'm not high energy. I'm not loud. I'm not a necessarily a comedian. Like I'm funny sometimes, but that's not, I'm not, you know, trying to get laughs out of people all the time. Um, like what, what, why do people watch me? Obviously people are watching me. For something. <laughs> for something. <laughs> I, and I was able to, oh, with some reflection, figure out, you know, I, I want to do now basically what I've always done, which is provide comfort to people mm -hmm. and provide a break, you know, mm -hmm. something to lift the spirits after yeah. your day to day life, which has influenced a lot of decisions that I make about my not just my stream, but my content as a whole. Yeah. Um, there's some things I don't talk about. I, I don't bring things really low. I, I don't try to say controversial, edgy things that are going to separate people. Um, because I know I have diverse, a diverse group of people in my chat. I know it because I know some of them. And I'm like, man, <laughs> if I were to bring up a certain topic, there would be conflict. And yeah. Avoiding conflict in those spaces is like pretty important. It is. I would say it is. And it's it's tough to do that because I feel like with content creators, you know, our personal life and our and our public life are intertwined and yes. we have we have to be the ones to like draw the line of what yes. we share and what we withhold i'm not gonna tell you everything i believe in mm -hmm. <laughs> all yeah. these like nitty-gritty issues i'm not gonna talk about politics yeah um, because i don't want that to be something that my viewers have to bear mm -hmm. when they're deciding if they want to watch me and that sounds kind of weird but it's i don't mean that in like a i don't want to lose people or i don't want to lose mm -hmm. members i mean that in I, you shouldn't have to think about it. Like I'm, we're here to play games. We're here to hang out. I'm here to give you a break. And this is my job. I'm not going to force you to think too hard. <laughs> I totally like, understand that. No, but so I totally touchy. understand that. There are just some things I don't want to talk about. I, I avoid them because I know that if we go there, like sometimes there's no stopping. Some people will develop an expectation that you mm -hmm. need to share everything or answer every question. And that's yeah. just not the relationship I want to have with my viewers. Exactly. Like there is a line between us. I'm not your friend. Mm -hmm. I care about you, but I have my own peace and my own personal life to protect. Every content creator has to do it at some point, either before controversy or after. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Hopefully before. Like, One can hopefully. hope. <laughs> and it's okay. not like... Yeah, and it's not like my front-facing version of myself is false. I'm not trying to give a false front, um, but there's just, you know, there's another side of the coin. Yeah, people will make assumptions about you, and sometimes I just have to bear with whatever those assumptions are. Um, 
because I'm not going to give someone the satisfaction of like forcing an answer out of me. Because once I do that, once we do that. Yeah, it's kind of we'll like give giving an inch. <laughs> someone else control of like what they want out of you. And then exactly once you get there, it's like hard to sometimes hard to take it back. I yeah. feel like before or like when I was also trying to learn how to stream, that was one of the things like that was one of my learning curves. I was like, OK, mm -hmm. I want chat to be interactive, but I don't want them to control me. So when you were like going from 100 to pushing a thousand viewers and then you were like deciding who mm -hmm. is it you want to be did you feel like you kind of had to push against an expectation because i feel like going or growing that fast like it starts to it does force you to reevaluate some things and you said you did but then what was it like actually going through that process uh, some advice i got was to Basically, like, make a list of the content creators that you watch and then figure out why do you like them. And I bet <laughs> I bet I have the note on my phone still. A three-year-old note? I would be surprised if it's still there. Yeah, it is there. <laughs> I found it. Um, creators I like. Mm -hmm. Jenna and Julian. Jenna Marbles. Julian yeah. Solomita. Yeah. Kelsey Kreppel, Cody Co. Um, mm -hmm. I have Post Malone on here. Curtis Connor, <laughs> who's not a con you know, I like Curtis Connor. not a conch creator, but he kind of is. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll figure out why I like him, mm -hmm. and then to look at yourself and say, okay, what qualities do you have? What do you yeah. think you are? And what do people say about you? Mm -hmm. And what people say about me, I have here: calming, refreshing, <laughs> wise, insightful, <laughs> wholesome, gentle, soothing. And I was like, okay, these are all things that I would also, in varying degrees, ascribe to the creators that I watch. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I realized if there are people who I watch, there are people who will watch me. Like if there's people who like the content that I like, yeah, and I could also put myself in that category, like there is a viewer that is aligned to me. Um, I mean, and Jenna Marbles, when she was making videos, mm -hmm. you know, she was everyone's big sister. And I that's kind of what I want to be in the Genshin space. Like I'm... I want to give the feeling of like, watching over your older si sibling's shoulder while they're playing yeah. a video game. And that's something I used to do with my dad. My dad is a gamer. So Aww. I would sit on the on like a chair, I'd pull up a chair and I would watch him play like Diablo or or Quake or or That's adorable. <laughs> other stuff. Empire Earth. Um, it started naturally. I wasn't thinking about myself really until mm -hmm. I got those numbers and I was like Ooh, do I even deserve to be here? <laughs> like, I'm not. I, I I don't have the energy that a lot of streamers have. Yeah, and I'm never going to be able to to mimic that. So I'm not going to try. I'd rather just be myself. But it took a while to. It took some real thoughtful reflection and continuous reflection. Still, sometimes now, to allow myself to be myself. Yeah, and trust that you know. Obviously, I'm innovating, and I should be innovating, and thinking about what I can do better, but I'm still going to be myself and there will be people. I also get what you mean, like wanting to continuously be yourself, but then when you compare yourself to others, it's like there's there's this whole gap of qualities that's just like yeah. that you can feel sets you apart. Like I also feel like a lot of the time, I've never been a funny person, like never in high school, never in, <laughs> never in college, and I'm not going to start being instantly funny now. Like mm. that's just you know some people are born with it you know some people are built different or whatever mm. um but then there there are still communities and people out there who will watch you and whatever your brand of funny is so when we got to, through all the streaming stuff and like when you've grown the streaming and you've grown your youtube channel you had this um it was like a branch out maybe not necessarily a pivot but you also branched out to art which was really mm. interesting and I feel like also understanding your previous content about like introspection and how calming and soothing your <laughs> communities were built on. Like, you know, the art pivot like makes sense now. Before I was also a little bit surprised, but like now it makes sense. Mm -hmm. But how did you like decide to go into that? It was a mixture of impulse and a desire to kind of tap back into my introspective artistic side like I think that's a muscle that got kind of atrophied in like hardcore 
all the 1.0 patches for Genshin. Like I was just, it was just all Genshin all the time. Yeah. Um, and I felt like, I kind of felt like I wasn't showing the whole part of my, of who I wanted to show of myself in my content. Um, mm. I don't know. I think it probably started by seeing a friend of mine, like painting. And I was like, man, I've always wanted to be an artist. I never really believed that I could do it. But I've taught myself so many things in my life True. Um, that if I, I kind of just wanted to challenge myself, be like, OK, I think I could do it. Like mm -hmm. I, I think with time and effort and passion, I can do it. Um, so I decided to turn it into a YouTube series partially for because I think the journey is really important. And yeah. I don't think you see the journey a lot of times with um, learning a new skill. You kind of see you see the results um, mm -hmm. and that could be inspiring but also discouraging because you don't really you don't really see the ugly part of how you get from point a to point b yeah or point the ugly part's important <laughs> it is important and it's it's important to it's hard to share yeah. and especially like another thing i i pinpointed in myself was i hate people seeing me trying to do something yeah. um i hate failing publicly it's yeah. very hard for me I really um, relate to that. Like, can I just say, I have a phobia of doing Spiral Abyss live. Like, even oh, if I really? have those videos. Yeah, <laughs> even if I have four-star clear videos, I have a phobia of doing it live. Failing publicly, I can't. I know there are some streamers who are, like, really great at it. They yeah. they make it so, so entertaining. I think streaming has helped me with that just mm -hmm. because it's inevitable that I'm going to fail in some way. may not be the game, but it could just be, you know, I misspeak or I... I I stutter or I say something wrong or I say something stupid. Like I learned in time to like roll with the punches of that yeah. and to enjoy and to like get comfortable making fun of myself. And I think that helped me with the decision to learn publicly, learn art publicly uh, with the intention of, of like being vulnerable and showing the actual process um mm -hmm. so yeah i started that on my main channel my numbers were obviously not as high on art channel on art videos because it's like you know what is it i watch i subscribe to this channel for genshin videos why am i seeing mm -hmm. an art video here <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah i yeah i think i took the wrong advice regarding where to put that um mm -hmm. And rather than starting on its own channel i started really strong and then i sputtered out and then i started it's on its own channel and mm -hmm. I allowed it to be like fully dedicated. It doesn't matter the views that I get on it because, you know, like your main channel is is kind of important, especially for sponsorships and stuff. So if your numbers, your viewership is inconsistent, it's it's those sponsor offers just tank yeah. in price. Um, <laughs> so I didn't I, and I wanted it to be completely unhindered. Um, so I moved it to its own channel and it's been much, much, much better. Um, OK. I feel less concerned. I also, also the channel did way better than I thought it was going to okay. do. The first video got like, I think it's up to like 300,000 views in it. And it's a yeah. lot of, it's not people who don't know, who don't, who've never seen me before. And that was a whole another level of encouraging. That's amazing. Um, but it's been cool to get back in touch with that side of me. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud and like happy with the, with where I've gotten and both in the channel and also in just like art itself, I allow myself to be um, a more a more complex public figure, <laughs> yes, than just <laughs> gaming. Um, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I don't know how long Genshin is going to be vital and and what the future holds for gaming. So as much as I want to like follow my heart and branch out, I'm going to um, mm -hmm. within reason, so that I have lots of you know I don't have all my eggs in one basket. Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind if my art channel became my main channel in the future. It's kind of like if if Genshin, you know, one day falls apart, then you have this backup plan of yeah. being a very quaint, you know, <laughs> quaint artist. I'm just like a on small the artist. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to paint. Yeah, like in my your little journey. cottage with your yeah. cats and your family. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's really cool that when you gave your art like its own channel to flourish it actually did i feel like um that's a dilemma a lot of 
content creator space when they're like trying to branch out or like yeah. try, try variety. And I also get this too. And I see feedback from some people. Like I see some people who are like, no, just keep all your stuff in one channel because we want to see it all. But then, th but then sometimes I realize okay that's totally not true for everyone and i you know you need like a more nuanced way of figuring yeah. that out for yourself on a technical level it really depends on how closely related your um your main content is from your side content like i i upload non genshin stuff on my main channel um but it's usually like it's like event co mm -hmm. of vlogs or it's collabs with faces that people know yeah. Um, or, or, or trying out, like I did like a tower fantasy video on there once. Yeah. Um, but I think from what I've learned from that on, a, on the technical side is that it's important to give people what they subscribe for on my main channel. People mainly subscribed for Genshin, Hoyo content and me. So unless it's a vlog, if it's not gaming, it's probably going somewhere else. And I have I my side dish channel, which that's for like full playthroughs of, of games that are not necessarily related to Genshin. Mm -hmm. um, that channel is doing well also. And then I have my art channel. I think my art stuff was just too far away from mm -hmm. Genshin. And, and, you know, if your video, I don't want people to feel like they subscribe for something they didn't want. And it doesn't bode well for your channel on like an analytics level if someone is getting a notification for a video and is not interested. Uh, yeah. So I'd rather give people a second, like a, if I want people to subscribe to my art channel for art and, and the conversion, like the view to sub ratio and the like ratio on that channel is so good because it's yeah. for one thing and that's what I do there. <laughs> that's great technical Thanks. input. All right. We've like talked a lot about how the streaming <laughs> and the YouTube stuff goes, which is great. Yeah. And like for me, I'm always happy to learn these things, whether you're, whether you're a streamer or a YouTuber, I always end up learning a lot. Um, but oh. I think we can like move on to the Fontaine stuff. I'd love to. There's like a lot there. And honestly, I was kind of impressed with, you know, how easy the transition was into Fontaine. Mm -hmm. I feel like when Sumeru came around, I got a little bit shocked maybe because like Sumeru and Inazuma are, are pretty different from each mm, other. True. But then going into Fontaine, they added the swimming. I mean, they added the diving, which oh, was really yes. pretty. Yes. Like, <laughs> it's Love so it. cool. But let's start with the Archon Quest because I mm. feel like that is one of the major features of 4.0 that actually really grabbed a lot of people's attention. Mm -hmm. I as agree. it should. Yeah, I agree. I have such mixed feelings about the Sumeru versus Fontaine. I, mm. I know there's a lot of like contention over it because um, I think I think the the Sumeru quest, Archon quest line was so good. And yeah. the Nikita quest was so good. Same. Um, I, I was actually afraid that like the Fontaine <laughs> quest wouldn't top it. Like that was my main fear. Yeah. I think I was I was surprised actually by the Fontaine quest and I mm -hmm. I really I think Farina especially is such a breath of fresh air. Yes. Um and Sumer, I think the quests were good. Mm -hmm. But I think the stakes were different. I I feel that there's a lot of risk in the Fontaine storyline like I feel there's risk for the traveler, there's risk for child, there's risk for the whole of Fontaine, like everything is at risk here. And I think with Nahida, that was like kind of the case, but it was more of like a corruption um, type of conflict, political. Yes. Yeah. And it was a lot of deep lore. I think we got a ton of deep lore in Sumer. So the people who like that, you know, ate it up. Mm -hmm. um, we got Abyss, Kanria, Ruka Devata, all that stuff. The the tree, Ermansol. Like it was a lot, like, but but to some degree, you kind of have to care about it. You mm -hmm. have to care about the history to like it. So I think I understand as much as I loved it. I understand why people fell off, um, mm -hmm. and I also know it's partially the exploration. I think the the desert just didn't <laughs> didn't didn't do it for a lot of people. Uh, it didn't do it, it for me either. <laughs> No, my desert exploration is like 50%. Um, yeah. I, I think objectively it was good, but I understand why people lost interest. And I think Fontaine, 
that introduction was perfect to grip people back. Like there was instant stakes. Farina is like a loose cannon as far as we can tell. Um, I think there's obviously a lot we have yet to learn about her. Um, but she's, she's threatens us basically as soon as we yeah. enter Fontaine. Um, yeah. And we have people lying to us and, and, True. and battles and people dying and, and trafficking. There's like a, like a female trafficking arc. I, they didn't say it explicitly. They kept it kind of PG in the, at the end of the Archon quest. Yeah. But talking about how Lynette was about basically traffic, sex trafficked. Um, yeah. That's serious. Yeah. And the stakes, and, and I don't know exactly where I fall as far as the House of the Hearth and, and Arlequino. Like, there's so much to uncover. And mm. I felt the pacing was great. Yeah. I really enjoyed the pacing, actually. I don't know if this is recency bias, honestly. And I always have this problem <laughs> when I, like, think about, like, the Sumeria Archon quest and the, and the Fontaine Archon quest. Um, I do think that. Fontaine is at least a little less verbose than than the Sumerian yeah. writing was. Yeah, the Fontaine <laughs> characters talk a little bit more like real people now. <laughs> they do, I and I think that was a problem in the past. Was just NPCs taking a hundred years to say <laughs> two lines of importance. It's snappier. It's snappier. Mm-hmm. I mean, I yeah. think I liked I liked the R and R quest. But I think there was way too much for the payoff. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it could have been five hours shorter. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and looking at Fontaine's world quests now, like I can finish them in one stream, and yeah, I don't yeah, stream yeah. for that long, which right. is by contrast, right? Like it's a, it's an improvement. I would call that an improvement. Yeah, um, I, it's tough because I know people. Some people enjoy it, like, mm-hmm. and, and I know I have a content creator bias where I'm like, if if I play a world quest on stream, I'm reading it out loud. I'm like voice, like uh, pseudo voice acting the whole thing. So it's very tiring for me. I do think that there is a difference, and I also, what did you think about the Inazuma Archon quest, the first one, first two? You know, I honestly feel like a lot of it was like wiped from my memory because <laughs> I did. <laughs> I just, I didn't, it didn't leave a, as strong it or did as not good hit. of an impression. It did not hit. No, mm. it did not hit. So I don't think it's recency bias. And I felt the same way when mm. we finished the ride in A arc and, and yeah. you know, we went in the plane of Euthymia and it took us all five minutes to convince Raiden to stop doing what she'd been doing for a thousand years. Yeah. And I felt completely deflated, like the risk, there's been so much risk and, and danger and mystery yeah. And shrouding in Izuma and it dissolved like that. True. Um, so I don't think it was recency bias. Okay. By comparison, A's second story quest oh my is gosh. like my lasting impression of Inazuma because that's what I want to be the lasting impression of Inazuma. <laughs> that was a banger. That was so good. <laughs> it kind of sucks because there's a lot of great quests within Inazuma. Mm-hmm. Um, I also I really like the Ayato quest. I think I think some the people Ayato didn't like it because it was very political and it was mm-hmm. a little bit slower paced. It wasn't as high stakes, but mm-hmm. I I was like really gripped the entire time. Sakura cleansing quest. I thought yeah. that was great. I was crying at the end. Um, Raiden's second quest. Her first quest was okay. Her second quest was amazing and added so much depth to her character. Yes, and to um, Inazuma's history. Yeah, like. That was cool. Big time. So There's many Ruse great characters quest. there. I didn't finish it. Oh, I'm it's so okay. Sorry. I'll tell you. I'll tell I'm you like now. Halfway that... through. <laughs> For two years. <laughs> you know, I'm a little bit surprised by that because that that is one of the more talked about quests. But I know it's okay. I have a I have like a huge like world quest backlog. Me also, too. I also I didn't I actually didn't finish the Golden Apple Archipelago two. Oh, really? Like, yeah. Oh, Even though I was, like, getting a lot about the characters, I was a little overwhelmed by the length. I'm not I'm not sure if, like, it was coinciding with, like, IRL stuff back then. Um, but also, I got tired going through Phil's <laughs> domain, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was the exploration. I remember it being pretty intense. Like, there was mm-hmm. a lot. A lot of people got dizzy during Kazuha's, his, like, twisty turn. It was a lot. And I think yeah. this most recent summer quest was a nice change of pace. And I know it was it probably because they were back a lot. It's probably because they were focusing most of their energy on 
Fontaine, but I think they did rather than do something big and have it be, it was something short, Mm -hmm. something self-contained that was really well done. It was polished and sweet and fun to interact with. And I loved that. I I had such a good time. Yeah. I really liked the map also, like the entire, um, like how it was constructed and you have the hydro idolins and stuff yeah like that was such so a cute, cute touch and then you walk into fontaine and try to talk to one of the idolins and you're like it's <laughs> <laughs> trying to kill me it's <laughs> hitting for hitting for like four million <laughs> hp yeah those, those those big ones are scary <laughs> um so when we were like um comparing the fontaine and the sumeru quest what you said about the stakes being instantly higher in Fontaine and then for Sumeru you had to care more about like the deep lore I think that like now that I think about it that's a good way of putting it because like Sumeru really tries to teach you more about the heart of I guess the heart of Ermin, Sol, and Tevat and stuff Tevat yeah yeah the big big picture overarching stuff yeah but then at the start like it's not necessarily as compelling unless you know, unless you're like totally absorbed into trying to figure out what Erminsel is. But then Fontaine, mm-hmm. by comparison, it's like the characters are so interesting. Yeah. Um, it's a lot more compelling. And it and I feel like the narrative and the story, also because the dialogue improved, like <sighs> it's the the characters are pushing the story forward a lot better. Yeah. Like, rather than the events trying to push it forward, mm-hmm. which is really cool. Totally. And, <laughs> I, I completely agree. Farina being a focal point and being someone we're we're gonna learn more a lot more about in the future. I really like their choice of, you know, making her a little bit insufferable. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. She's she's very different from all the other archons. Um she's for Wolf for one, she likes to be in the spotlight. This is the first time we've had an archon who's not like hiding incognito not right. captured just, yeah <laughs> in a bubble or yeah. have social anxiety so mm-hmm. it's it's a nice change of pace she seems like a very real threat i don't really know i don't know i don't I, there's a lot of players and i don't really know whose side i'm on i don't know who's on our side um we don't even know if lenny's on our side lenny and lynette there is deep stuff going on like the sinking of fontaine that's serious mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the disappearances, that's serious. The, like the eidolons and dis- dissolving into water. And um, there's one more component. Oh, the high potential hydro dragon. Oh, Nivellet. <laughs> that's a big deal. Yeah, I, yeah. I feel like they made it all but obvious. <laughs> I've been I so know, right? sad. Oh, it suddenly <laughs> stopped raining the moment they have their heart to heart. I wonder how that He's happened. He's a tender soul. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and the lore dump that we got from Nuvilet at the end about the punishment for like sin and mm. um, yeah, does, that could be like uh, dissolving into water to like make recompense or like or like a baptism. Like there's so much symbolism, and there's obviously conflict with Farina and the other Archons because she said it at the beginning. Um, mm. to even put another god on trial so oh and the the what's the machine called that the oratrice oratrice yeah like yeah. what's going on with that um, <laughs> <laughs> who are who is I, that it is cool that there's like these all these mysteries like there are all these plot points but they i what i like about how the acts were constructed is they're a little bit in the background because yes the characters really draw your attention. Exactly. I think that's how it should be. Yes. I think that's how it should be. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's why everyone's loving it so much. There's stuff for the deep lore people. There's stuff for the people who just want to see their favorite new characters interact and want to see the conflict. Um, And it's all coming together very beautifully, I think. Yes, exactly. I really hope that, you know, the payoff for like both ends or either end is is good enough so far it has been Mm -hmm. like at least at the end of the acts it has been good um Mm -hmm. the way that i read act two i was like this is a really good um navia main quest you know it's it's really good Mm. seeing navia as like a main character because it makes traveler more bystander and 
it mm-hmm. I found it more interesting because Traveler wasn't necessarily the main character and no, in she that wasn't. sense. Yeah. So she everything wasn't in trouble. Was, like she exactly. was she was totally a side character. Yeah. Um, and I like I don't mind. You know, we've been <laughs> the main character for every patch since the beginning. So Yeah. Yeah, I we're just like trying to figure out what's going on. Child's more <laughs> of a main character than we are in this quest. True. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have to rescue that guy. I know. <laughs> or <Prison> something. Break. <laughs> yeah. It's cool being a witness to what the other characters are doing and what's happening to them because then you get this perspective that inter- that that lets you enjoy it a bit more, I think. Yeah. Because when Traveler is the main character, like Paimon ends up, you know, doing all the main character stuff instead. <laughs> traveler <laughs> i know i don't like that i i really wish they would give the travelers more lines mm-hmm. I, uh, like do you remember in the um we will be reunited quest there was yes. this extremely sensitive tender moment where the traveler is seeing the abyss sibling for the first time yes. and they have like a cutscene, and then it immediately jumps into paimon like um, i don't understand what's going on and i'm just like <laughs> I'm wiping tears away from my face. Like, I don't want to hear. I don't yeah. want to have to be babied and exp- it explained again. At the end of Act 2, it was a, a good time having Nivellet explain a lot of stuff. You know, that that voice is like... Oh, yeah, yeah. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that was, that was really cool. And aside from Nivellet being really stylish and True. really daddy, like, they... <laughs> It is true that they are putting a lot of allusions to him being the Hydro Dragon. And I am I'm a little bit surprised at how obvious they're making it. Yeah, and very obvious. So either, you know, they are kind of like babying us a little bit in that sense, or it's a little or it's a red herring somehow, which is a misdirection. Like, yeah. Which Which wouldn't be shocking considering how the story like we're basically like detectives in the first um two acts. So it's not impossible that there would also be uh, like a mystery mystery components to the actual story i mean people are saying that maybe he's the actual archon and farina is yeah like a like a puppet or or not a puppet but like a she's like the front of it which i I don't know could be possible they pulled fast ones on us before so (laughs) as long as it's entertaining Mm -hmm. and exciting and it makes sense i'll be happy True. It has to make sense. It can't just be like, uh, you know, this is what you thought all along and then like just for the shock <laughs> value and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In terms of themes or like thematically, um, because you said that is like one of the one of the things that um, is good to pay attention to, especially between Sumeru and Fontaine, like where are the how are the themes evolving in your eyes? I think the biggest theme in Sumeru was sacrifice I th- but I think we've been seeing that I think that's been a theme throughout the whole game um, but we saw it a lot knowledge and sacrifice and yeah. how it seems like those two are kind of opposites uh, or rather a sacrifice is required to get what you want or mm-hmm. to find out the truth mm-hmm. um, Fontaine themes I don't know if I can even answer that question yet what do you think I'd rather hear what you, what you think about that <laughs> I feel like what Fontaine has been doing so far is it's making us question truth like a lot. Oh yes, true, and true, yes, true, illusions. true. <laughs> yeah, illusions. Like yeah. we did get a little bit of that in in Sumeru, where but yeah, but, the samsara. Yeah, like we were we were kind of questioning reality um, mm-hmm. when it came to the samsara, but then. Here, I feel like there are so, like, as you said, there are so many players and, like, Mm -hmm. they are introducing a lot of, you know, motions, actions into the agenda, into the events. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, what's real and what's not? And they already introduced through the teaser. um, This is is an act. This is a show. We're diverting your attention. Right. That's, they're making it very clear that we shouldn't be... 100% 100% trusting of everything we see which which could also point to there being red herrings mm-hmm. as far as, and we might think we have something figured out but it's like mm-hmm. you know it's just what it's like L and uh, yeah. like Yagami just <laughs> one step ahead of each other <laughs> both yeah. time uh, yeah. but it's just 
the Genshin writers being ahead of us. Um, which I would I wouldn't mind that at all. I would love some surprises. Um, it just needs to make sense. Like that's the most uh, important thing. Which I think yeah. they've taken they've taken themselves very seriously and they don't, mm. they don't mess around. Like they, they have goofy dialogue with, with like some of the surface level stuff, but mm. with the deep lore puzzle pieces uh, for what's really going on, like what Tibet is, what we're doing, like, why are we here? Why are we separated? What's yeah. the deal with the primordial one? Like Genshin does not mess around. Um, yeah. So I don't anticipate we're getting closer to the end. Like we don't have that many <laughs> regions left, um, which <laughs> It's it's still going to be a couple of years, but it's not much long. Like, how much more information can we get True. beyond the truth of the wor- of this world? And like, yeah. what are we going to get from Fontaine? Like, I'm always yeah. curious. What is our takeaway from each region? Like my like, I think my takeaway from um, Sumeria's region, or at least what the traveler got from Sumeria's region, a lot of it was Ermin Soul. Like, just mm-hmm. learning so much about the effects of Ermin Soul. And yeah. I wonder if what we learn as as a traveler from Fontaine is going to be about the primordial stuff, whether it's the waters yeah, or the one. Why does the primordial one exist? Why did yeah. she raise up? Uh, that. <laughs> yeah, like why why did she take control of Tavat and what mm-hmm. happened between her and the dragons? Like, yeah. there's a lot of questions, and I yeah, we keep hearing the word primordial. And why? Why are the people of Fontaine born with sin? Like, what sin? What? What? What do they do? And and what is that? I also wonder if we're gonna get answers about forbidden knowledge. Like, I was who's forbidding it that. from us? You know. <laughs> and and like, what is it? What are and the what origins the of like the abyss? Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's like somewhere on the cards, especially with Child's arc. Yeah, because- with Child. Yeah, because he is like bringing that whole thing out like he was in the abyss and then he awakened this thing. So like, where is that? Where is that thing leading us? He was condemned. So we have to get answers or that has to be reinvestigated and reevaluated. Um, why would he be found guilty in this case? It, it seems he doesn't know, which leads us to believe that it's a larger. I don't know, like it could even be something similar to what's going on with the people of Fontaine, which is he's carrying the sins of another, um, which is something that we've seen with um, even Kaya and, and Mm. Conria and the Hilly Charles, like carrying the sins of ancestors um, or, or associations like the Fatui harbingers. um, Yeah. Like it's really (laughs) guilty because of that, (laughs) because of them. Right. We we don't have enough information. I know. Poor guy, child. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he was super stunned. Loved, <laughs> loved seeing Nuvillet just, just knock him out. Uh, so satisfying. I know. <laughs> he just, he just teleported from one area of the room to another and slammed him into the ground. So I can't wait for the next Arc Conquest. I am so excited. <laughs> Four point one. Four point like, one. Okay, so the predictions I've seen for. 4.1 like our conquest content is going to be well busting child out of jail or at least mm-hmm. visiting child in jail um like with the the fortress i think is there is there prison um mm-hmm. and then nivelet is coming out so i'm guessing there's going to be like some big story arc involving him right. a lot more but mm-hmm. like where do you think um the direction is going to go immediately like in 4.1 well, I think it has to first be like quest- questioning the mechanism of the yeah. or- oratrice. Is that what it's called? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like the, if this is the first time that the machine has disagreed with Nuvillet, like now it needs to be challenged because who who actually does make the final call? Mm-hmm. Um and what is the reason for the condemnation? So I think there's gonna be a lot of scrutiny and in answering that question, you know. Linny wants the Linny and Lynette wants the answer to that question. Um, yeah, and obviously we know well. We know from Linny's explanation that Arlequino cares about that as well because it could be tied into why Fontaine is like doomed, like <laughs> suffering, <laughs> right? Uh, so I think that's where it's going to go immediately, and I it could lead into like man versus 
machine. <laughs> I'm machine, <kidding>. <laughs> yeah. Well, kind of like who 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 gets to decide what happens? Yeah. And could oratories actually be something that needs to be destroyed? Um, oh, that would like, be could an it have interesting result. Who what what is powering it? Like what where does it gain its consciousness? Yeah, I don't think we know that. I think the like the popular um, suspect is the gnosis, but mm. like. Actually, now that you mention it, if the Oratrice does get destroyed, like, I would see that happening as part of Farina's character arc, maybe. Mm. Um, like, that's like a, a very random future headcanon thing where it's like, if the Oratrice is destroyed, hopefully it's like, for a good reason. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really important. It powers the city. Yeah. And it makes the decisions like it's supposed to be like an infallible machine it's a nice idea but how infallible can a machine be and is it like how is it getting its information you know can it like see into your soul um yeah. or is it like does it have surveillance and does it know what's going on you know everywhere it's so hard <laughs> to believe that <laughs> that'd be so scary <laughs> right <clears throat> i've been reading too many sci-fi novels but yeah, I don't know. There's conflict already between that between those two, and yeah. I we from there it's probably going to be forging like a temporary deal with Arlecchino to like Ooh. help meet an, a mutual goal, which is uncovering the secrets of the Oratrice. I'm so uh, interested in how Traveler's going to encounter Arlecchino. Surely like, she's going to be playable, right? Sh surely God, surely please. they wouldn't do that to us they wouldn't make her not playable i hope that that doesn't mean like taking her from a villain to you know a quasi villain like child Same. i want her to be evil i have that opinion where it's like you know not every playable character has to be super good <laughs> no i wouldn't have mind if we had to pull raiden while she was still like, like a the, dictator of, yeah yeah of, uh, in azuma that would have been so interesting. Well, we were still at war with her. If that was yeah. possible, that would have been cool. I wouldn't have minded. Yeah, minded exactly. That. It's like, give us give us some variety. <laughs> yeah, I don't need... I would rather them be fully evil than like half redeemed or like watered down. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. The watered down bit would be weird because it's like, you build this character up to be all this stuff and then... When they become playable, it's like we, we get a half version of them. That's, yeah. that's a little bit weird. Or it's not what it seemed like. Or they, you know, they have a little brother. So, <laughs> you know, get them some slack. <laughs> They're a good person. Child's a good person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Child's just a guy in, in he's jail. He's just a guy you know? with a kid, with a little kid brother. So we got to mm -hmm. break him out. No, he's, right. he's a, I really like him. He's, a, he's an interesting, complex character. But I wouldn't mind a fully villain character yeah like let us play his delusion version sometime. yeah that would be awesome <laughs> i would love That'd that be really fun so aside from the huge content of the archon quest that like fontaine brought us mm. um the exploration is a huge thing the mm. way that they changed that up like how is it for you like going in and you know oh. getting literally deep into fontaine <laughs> <laughs> for the first time thank you <laughs> uh, i'm enjoying it more probably more than i've ex enjoyed exploration in a long time um the underwater is very me personally i feel they designed it really well like it's a very relaxing immersive experience um i'm grateful for the thought they put into it and not making it too like obnoxious with oxygen i and i think following off of exploration fatigue with sumeru i think that was especially wise decision because it made True. it low lowered the barrier of entry for casual players and i think that's where a lot of people get the di like they have a disconnect as it's like the hardcore players they're not complaining about exploration but like a good probably majority of genshin players are casual players and don't have all the mm -hmm. time in the world to run around on sand and in these these like uh in these like <laughs> mazes uh below the ground so yeah I th i'm grateful and i think it was wise that they made the exploration fun and the music mm -hmm. is great and oh, the music. it's like i feel very the rewards are great like it's just a very satisfying exploration experience 
Yeah, I agree. Like being able to just stay in the water for however long and no pressure to get out, you know, yeah. it's like living the life. <laughs> yeah, well, let me be a mermaid, you know? Exactly. You know, that's something you can't really do IRL unless unless you like dive or like, you know. Like, really. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I think like to me, that is one nice thing. It's just like, living vicariously through the traveler this yeah. time and like, you know, getting True. to exist underwater for mm-hmm. for a long time at periods. How have you been doing like with the world quests? Because they've been unlocking some interesting exploration points. And thankfully it's mm. not as locked as I felt the Aranara quest oh, was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. Like in Sumeru the Ar- too. Yeah, and the Pari locked quest also. The first jet quest also unlocked Oh, the, the, like the Golden Slumber, can, I think? The Golden Slumber, yeah. Which yeah. I really like that quest, but that aside. Um, hmm. I've only done a couple. I did the, f- I did uh, one of the the Melazine quest. Mm-hmm. Um, the one where we follow like the painter to help get the paint. I liked that one. I thought, the, I thought it was uh, a good payoff for the length of it. And the characters were, were interesting. Yeah. Um, Although I was kind of left with more questions than answers at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Regarding the, I'm talking about the very end where we talk to the drag. Oh, Elinus. Elinus. Yeah. I'm a little bit confused about that, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I need to watch a video about it. I was like confused about it until I did the other quests. Oh, like, oh okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting thing that Fontaine is doing is like, instead of one huge web um, of like R and R quests, the different mm-hmm. quests around they relate to each other. Oh, okay, that's good to know. Yeah, but I've I've yeah. done a couple like random other world quests and they were quick. Yeah, I haven't done yeah. a ton honestly, other than that one. I started doing um the one with the uh, what's her name salsa <laughs> salsa <laughs> the painting quest. I keep yeah. stumbling across that. That one's really cute. Um, it is so far. And the one with the guy stuck in the his, stuck in the sand. I'm like halfway through that one, or I'm I'm killing all of the the cores oh or getting gosh. the cores. I haven't what? done that one. It's like so I saw funny. a screenshot of the guy, and I was like, "What is that?" It's hilarious. The first like the first like ten minutes of dialogue in that quest, you feel it feels like it like a like a acid dream or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's like something else. Uh, I need to find the guy. It. Yeah, it's interesting. It's I think it's funny. It's funny. Okay. Your chat will like it. I hope I stumble across him soon. <laughs> he's like next to one of the be like a lake or something, or he's close to one of the waters in front of a little house. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was like, I'm now thinking about that guy. I wonder how he's doing now that I've left him there for so long <laughs> in my world. <laughs> I Getting hope he's some, still there. Uh, I'm happy with the um, amount of region that they released at a time. I think it was a good amount. There's enough for hardcore players to like 100% the map and do all the quests. And it's, I feel like I have enough time to pace myself and I have lots to explore and lots of quests to do. But, um, you know, we got the Archon quest. We don't need that much more <laughs> yeah. to do other than Honestly. explore. So now that you mention it, like the size of Fontaine that they release, it's it's a good amount, like a digestible amount mm. i remember when they released the entire sumeru rainforest region so big yeah oh my and then gosh. everything after was just desert <laughs> yeah true man why did they do that <laughs> i don't know I just... the, the rainforest and the water are, are definitely more appealing than <laughs> yeah for me <laughs> mm, and the events were kind of there weren't only a few events that i was like okay that was good but a, a lot of them were just repeat events so I kind of just was like, I would start stream and I'd be like, I don't know. I don't know mm-hmm. what I want to do today. I mm-hmm. played a lot of variety games during that time. Played a lot yeah. of Honkai Star Rail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Played a lot of Star Rail. <laughs> In the upcoming Fontaine events, who do you, like, which character do you think is going to get a spotlight first? Because, th- right, they oh. usually do events that, like, can revolve around, like, one character or a group of characters. Like, we had the Kave one. We had the Diluc oh. limited event. Oh. You had the Albedo Infantane. one. Imagine if we got another child one. Like, <laughs> I can't. Uh, he's had enough. I can't. <laughs> I'm trying to think who has not gotten the spotlight yet because we got a lot of Navia. Yeah. We got 
We haven't really gotten Fremenet yet, but I've, I was going to say Fremenet. I would actually love to understand his character a little more because yeah. I feel like I would love like a diving or like a water related story Ooh. quest for him. And I, I, yeah, his character resonates with me a lot. So <laughs> I use this. <laughs> He's just a little guy. Yeah. And he obviously carries a lot of burden from the House of the Hearth, and I would love to understand that more. Um, Clorinde is another character we don't necessarily know that much about other than her yes. relationship with Navia. So um, I I'm I wouldn't mind. I, I will be pulling. We will be pulling. Mm-hmm. Like, take us through the duelists <laughs> arena and stuff. Yeah. Let her have her showdown with Child. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. That would I would allow that. Yeah, Ch- Child gets a lot of screen time, like, interest. I think Hoyo loves yeah. him, which, which is pretty funny. They do love him. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's I feel like character. Child is the most flirtatious character with the Traveler. He's pretty um, blatant with it. And then there's Lenny who's, like, 100% Riz all the time. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> you, don't even, you don't even mean it. You're just saying it to everybody. <laughs> True. And then there's Child who's, like, trying to narrate his his fa- his recent family events to the Traveler. I found that scene so so cute, actually. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that was great. That Good was writing. surprisingly, yeah, exactly. It was, like, surprisingly friendly <laughs> and human of him, which was really True. cute. You immerse yourself a lot into, like, the story and exploration. Um, which I really appreciate and admire. And I see you like paying attention to details and characters and stuff. So I feel like talking first impressions with you has been really fun. I, I would have loved to ask you more questions about like where you see your, your content going. You do guides. Do you do lore stuff? I actually don't. You I don't. read a Why lot did of I think lore. you did. It's maybe because you post about it. Interesting. Would you ever want to? I'm kind of like you in the sense that I'm bad at retaining certain <laughs> details and info, but I do like like liter- literary analysis. I do enjoy video essays. Me too. The, the reason I didn't start doing video essays is because I realized it's going to be a very similar process to making guide videos where mm. it's like a lot of writing and revisions and mm-hmm. I don't really want to do, I don't necessarily want to like double the load there. So yeah, what I do instead- I is <laughs> talk with people who you know are on similar pages like <laughs> that's uh i talked to ashikai about oh um, yeah that stuff and it was really fun i was like wow this is so this is what it's like looking into the mind of a lore creator yeah. and um getting to know yeah, how great. they process info right that's that's great i've i've branched into it a little bit uh i've done two two videos now of quest or character like analysis, analysis. Yeah. Um, but I really struggle to stay consistent with it just because I've put so many things on my plate. Um, and it, you know, I'm known as a, as a, what's the word? I don't know, like a casual, I'm a casual, like a casual player. Yeah. I'm, I'm not like, I'm here mostly for entertainment. So although I, it's hard to, to make myself consistent on that stuff. Cause I've had the privilege of having such like a casual, <laughs> Mm-hmm. approach to my content for Genshin so I don't have to do much above what I would naturally do um, but I, I do really that. enjoy the two quests I've done but yeah I need to get back on the horse for that I have I'm already behind one if you do try to absorb and like analyze a lot of the story content of Genshin like it is it is constantly uphill that mm-hmm. is a lot to do processing stories in a different way or like not necessarily continuously going into lore or like uncovering the history or like trying to pick out every artifact set like at least processing a story even if it's in a more casual or thematic or yeah. you know like literary way it can be you know it's a good change of pace i would say yeah that's been my approach because i think that's that's how like my favorite parts of doing quests on on stream is talking about it with my community so i wanted to like take that and figure out how to like put that on YouTube without it just being a re-upload of the quest, which I've decided to start uploading Archon quests onto my main channel anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, but for characters, I really enjoyed yeah. like thinking through it that way. <laughs> the first quest I did was Nahida's second quest, which was just like a monstrous that quest. Is- <laughs> like there's so much thematically it's huge. Lore wise, mm-hmm. it's huge. It was a long quest. I mean, it's an Archon character quest. So yeah. it was massive. And then Baiju 
was my next one, which was a little easier, but there was a lot of like con contextual information to give. Um, Yomiya is the next one I need to do. I've, I've recorded Ooh. some of it already. It was Yomiya's second quest. Have you played it? Yes, that oh, is a good one. So good. One of, I think it's the best, the mm. best, my favorite. And as far as I think it was just like tens across the board. It was, yeah, it was it was so good. I feel like Yoimi is Yoimi is a really fun character to analyze because yeah. you don't meet a lot of her in real life. <laughs> no, she's so kind and yeah. thoughtful and considerate and compassionate. And uh, she's such an admirable character. Um and that quest just like deepened my understanding. <laughs> it, it reinforced that in, in yeah. her. It was such a great story. But it's been yeah. nice to have a little bit more like high effort videos going into going on to my main like YouTube Genshin channel. Because unless you're on yeah. my stream, you're not going to know necessarily that I really care about the Archon Quest because I don't upload it anywhere other than like my VOD archive. Um, so I wanted to give people or to let people know that and, and yeah. like share my thoughts if they so want to hear it. I think it's it's really cool getting more perspectives or at least getting to perspective of like your favorite streamer on this huge piece of content that a lot of people are enjoying. Some people will enjoy the full breadth of the content and some people just want the tidbits, but whatever you feel like doing, I feel like it's someone's going to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Um and it's not going to like kill your YouTube channel to channel to try something new one time. And you can also make a second channel. Like if you want your main channel to be mostly guides or like information for the like meta gameplay side. Yeah. You can totally start a new channel and let that be more on the. Uh, yeah. Like the lore. casual. Lore yeah. Or story. casual. Totally. I feel like that's one thing um, I've been contemplating a lot because um, after finding editors to work with who can actually handle like casual content from me i try to put it on my main channel and then like it doesn't necessarily correspond because of course people are subscribed to my main channel for like guides and stuff what you said about it's important to give subscribers what they subscribe for i am going to think about that a lot because i've been wondering like okay am i going to for example, do what Zyux did. Like he has this two Y Ox yeah. <laughs> the channel, right? Where he has like his super chaotic stream highlights and edits and stuff. And it's like full streamer Zyox vibes. Yeah. And right? that's paid off for him big time. Yeah. Well, letting people outside of Twitch see who he actually is on stream and to connect with people who would enjoy his content. Um, yeah. So I think it's worth it. If you have an inclination to make content for it, mm -hmm. I think the something to keep in mind is just like whatever is the barrier or the concern for you, try to find a way to like knock it out. Um, okay. If there's one thing that's holding you back, just hmm. find a way around that one thing. If you're worried about messing up your analytics on your main channel, okay, that's fine. Put it on a different channel. It's not going to hurt. It's not going to hurt you true. even if the video tanks like – Maybe it might not be worth the risk, but it's worth mm -hmm. doing. Mm. You never know, really. You never know what's going to take off. One of my fears putting it on a new channel is just like less people are going to see it. Like that's just True. the most thing. That's just the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then con actually considering the long term payoff and trade off like that's a totally that's a totally different and potentially more important consideration because mm -hmm. if my initial concern is that with this single video less people are going to see it because less people are subscribed it's a new channel like that's technically a short-term consequence if you right. play your cards right totally and and i think that's been the case with a lot of my efforts in the past like the first video of something new didn't necessarily do well mm -hmm. but it took one video in that like series so, so to speak to like invigorate all the other ones and mm. make people go back and watch stuff. Whatever you want to do, give it a try somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully it's helpful <laughs> to any content creator or upcoming content creator who's listening. I don't have it all figured out. There are definitely things that I'm not satisfied with with my current like content landscape, but I have lots of time <laughs> to to figure it out and to switch things up. So, you don't need a nothing nothing 
just happens all at once, you know? And sometimes something that seems like a failure or a waste of time can turn into, you'll use it later or it will come back later. That's honestly always so fun. Just like going into a convo with another creator, like whatever they create. Yeah. I mean, for a lot of us, it's like, unless you live in a, like a content house, you don't have a lot of creators you can talk to regularly. Mm-hmm. So I don't, at least in my regular life, I don't have a lot of people who like necessarily know what I'm thinking about or will understand where yeah. I'm at. Um, so it's nice. It's just nice to like be on like there's a, just a uh, foundation of understanding that we yeah. have with each other that like I don't need to explain this exactly. this concept to you. Like if I if I give you the Cliff Notes version, you're going to understand what I mean. And we uplift each other that way. So it's yeah. Cool. So before we go, um, last advice to any listener, like on and you know what, on any topic, because we talked on a anything. lot about like creation. If you mm-hmm. have like introspection or game advice, even or like, don't wait for things to be perfect to start enjoying them. Whatever you're doing, there's there's beauty in the present moment. There's beauty in the incompleteness of all the things that you want to accomplish. And it's important to know, to keep that in mind because tomorrow is never promised. So you can enjoy and you should enjoy the things that you're doing at the moment that you're doing them, not, not looking to the future for like at this point of, of like achievement and accomplishments. That's when I can be, that's when I can be content, you know? That's what I've been thinking about lately. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you, Dish, for coming. And yeah. that's that's going to be it for this episode. Um, let me know in the comments what your favorite part about 4.0 is and mm-hmm. what you are looking forward to for 4.1. For our next Sevi Talks episode, Doro, aka Doro44, and I will be reacting to your Fontaine thoughts and opinions. So look forward to that. You can listen to this podcast on both Spotify or YouTube. You can leave your comments up here on YouTube. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to leave a like. Subscribe to my channels. Smash like. Dish, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the thoughtful questions. And it was very nice to level with you. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I, I gotta appreciate that. Thank you for like being so down to earth and like actually bringing some fun answers too Aww, so <laughs> that's gonna be all for this episode and uh i'm gonna see you all soon take care <laughs> <laughs>